you know, modern day African American hairstylists, we aren't typically the kind of people who would use our professional and personal experiences to create a documentary that confronts the narrative about our miseducation and misrepresentation of Afro hair. Like many African-American hairstylists, I long to go home to Mama Africa. Well, at the same time, I want to represent a brand who, like me, holds the values of we are one and love, you know, to set myself aside from all the other regular cosmetologists in the industry. But honestly, personally and professionally, I can attest to the all too familiar African American disclosures of teasing, uh, revisionism, hair shaming, and discrimination that remain traumatic and at times debilitating to say the least. Uh, this trance of sorts of our constant back and forth of our regurgitation of our responses to these horrific, racist, white, imperialistic standards of beauty is doing something I see and feel daily as an African-American hairstylist and black woman. I see what it's doing. It's, it's like it's paralyzing our intellect, our ability to act and make judgment, you know, like deers caught in the headlights. Our knee-jerk and visceral responses of nagging and fighting and complaining, it's, it's becoming the demise of the black beauty industry. Martin Luther King Jr. says, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. If you're not careful and you don't have historical reference, your arguments are, they are, the bedrock of them will be distorted in half-truths. They don't have real beauty culture historical reference. Absolutely. So, but unfortunately, the black hair stylist or black cosmetologist has been demoted as if merely they are just uh, technicians. Uh, this was the first pick, uh, actually, the only pick in the country, the only comb in the country that is patented with Marl's name on it. But really? on beyond that, the, the pick is very unique because it, it was created to specifically address African-American hair, you know, and, and, and specifically black natural hair. He wanted to ensure that, uh, you know, that these combs were created because a lot of uh, the other picks and combs were not built to go through and comb we, through. We follow these racial constructs that was formulated to put you in a subservient position. And so science is the great equalizer. Well, now, if science is the great equalizer, then history is the counterpoise. In the beginning, we were all but ingredients in the primordial soup from the waters deep in the center of Mama Africa. Curly hair, Afro textured hair, is the first human and as far as, as, as changing hair texture and color, that's not something new. That's not something that belongs to other people, other Europeans. That's something that, that people of color, people on the continent of Africa, have been doing for thousands of years. I love anything that shines light on uh, Black history in general, uh, because our history is intertwined in every facet and domain of the world that we live in, uh, particularly beauty, and we're left out of all of those. Um, and so even if you look, if we advocate for our students to learn Black history in the U.S., 
it probably would be centered around like wars and things like that, government, governmental things, but it probably wouldn't be hair focused or the other industries that black people have influenced. Um, and so I'm here for any, if like if cosmetology is our lane and that's our passion, like then we can make it our business to share our, the history that we've had in the industry in our domain. Yeah. Um, and that's what it's that's what it's about. It's the narrative is it's from our perspective. Typically, when we look at uh, documentaries, the uh, cosmetologists we're usually the subject of it. We're never behind the lens. Um, I don't know what I'm doing, but cross your fingers for me, Renee. Um, yeah. So I'm, do I'm doing my best to really. Now here's the reality. African Americans, we are America's cultural tastemakers. The this is not a trend. It is a trend. Wendy, I'm telling you it's oh, a trend. The Kardashians make everything a trend. It's a topic that's ignited serious conversation. Cultural appropriation. I love that the urban style is transcending over to the other world. It is currently 2022. And given the number of educational institutions, options for learning, and levels of access we have to become informed, not to mention all the various advances in science and technology, the most many Americans have to say, report, write, depict, read, and teach about textured hair here in America is what it looked like how long it is, how thick it is, or is it, is it fake or is it real? I don't understand what is going on here. Is this some type of a hair Stockholm syndrome when it comes to us accepting our own hair? The hair community was orchestrated for all hair types to embrace their natural curl pattern, no matter what it is, okay? At no one point in time when, because there were Africans in Europe, just like they like today, Africans are in Ukraine. Right. You know, there's Africans everywhere. Absolutely. So they were not, their features and our features are not new to them. But we're talking about where did it, the wheel fall off to the point where we internalized it and now anything that comes from or looks European or what we perceive as European. Right. Now all of a sudden we're gonna reverse, reverse it, it and, and say we shouldn't do it because then we're not acting black. Right. Or we're not this yeah. or we're not natural or we're not this. See that is all of the convolution of what we are right. so trying to straighten out and get some real dialogue to, to change things several conversations <laughs> and and we know that for Ladosha yes. this is like the epitome of my entire career to be sitting in front of the person the lineage of the person that's responsible for why I quit my job really to, yeah I, yeah I quit my job to become a cosmetologist because of your dad mm -hmm. Dr. Willie Morrow genuinely loathe a lot of the people in the natural hair community for the simple fact that they are very, very misleading. They push products in order to gain profit, and many of them really don't care too much about the natural hair community. Hair braiding requirements are inconsistent. 26 states don't require licensure at all. Some states require specialty license with 50 to 500 hours of training, while more extreme states like Idaho and Montana require a cosmetology license. Stay on education just real quick. Um, there are essentially two elements that are trying to deregulate our industry. One element is big, big brand um, uh, sort of grooming salons, right? I'm not gonna name names, but imagine something you'd see TV ad for a national brand. Well, those companies don't really feel like they need cosmetology school. They're into churning and burning. They're into getting talent, burnt, running them into the ground, and then that person might, might leave the industry, right? So there's that element that wants kids faster so that they can burn through them faster. Then there's another element which I don't entirely understand. Um, it's called the Institute for Justice, and they have different offshoots. In Louisiana, it's called the Pelican Institute. 
but the Institute for Justice, this is gonna sound conspiratorial, but just stay with me. The Institute for Justice is funded by the Koch brothers, and that's K-O-C-H. So not like the soda, K-O-C-H, the Koch brothers. And they have been really great at getting into states and allowing for natural braiding salons to be in existence without any type of regulation or oversight whatsoever. Um, and it's a really, really clever tactic. Um, and it, it's worked in almost 20 states, um, from super liberal to conservative. So it, it kind of pulls on each party's heartstrings a little bit. And what it basically it does is it allows for people to have a natural braiding salon where you're allowed to wash, style, um, obviously braid and trim, and the legislation will say trim hair without any type of oversight whatsoever. The notion of regulating black hair is not new. It has roots in American history. Um, black hair was regulated by slave masters who uh, shaved the hair of enslaved people of African descent as a means of control and punishment. What do you think about the natural hair movement. I want you to, you know, talk about it too. You know, okay. what you guys think about the, the natural, it's the Y2K, this is the new. The other natural hair movement was, you know, the 60s, you know yeah. what I'm saying? The, the reason for it, you might say, is like a new awareness among black people that their own natural appearance, its physical appearance is beautiful and it's pleasing to them. Black is but this has changed because black people are aware and White people are aware of it too because white people now want uh, natural wigs. They want wigs like this. Dig it? Isn't it beautiful? The other natural hair movement was, you know, the 60s, you know yeah. what I'm saying? So we know what that was. That was definitely a political statement, all right? Uh, but part of, part of, okay? Yeah. Black is beautiful for sure. But um, what's up with the natural hair movement of the, as Cheryl would call it, the Y2K natural hair movement? <laughs> what did y'all think about that? Yeah, because I feel like it kind of got lost. And now we back, so I just hope that we can get past the, the texture shaming. Okay, I like that. All right, here come the beautician. <laughs> Keep it 100. We only get, it's our 15 minutes. Keep it 100. The pressure's on you. <laughs> okay, okay. You. What's up with that natural hair movement? Okay, I have mixed emotions about the natural hair movement. Um, most of my clients have natural hair. Um, but after having conversations with clients and uh, talking about their decision as to why they went natural. I think there's a lot of misconceptions when it comes to using relaxers um, because people are looking at it as it's damaging or um, it's not good for your hair, mm. which that could be said about any hairstyle, you know, mm -hmm. whether you're natural or relaxed. Mm -hmm. It's all about if the person who is giving you that service is 100% trained to do Go back to the basics. We are hair professionals, so we have to look at a healthy scalp, creates healthy hair, healthy diet, water intake, just all of these conversations need to be put back into the ears of our clients when we're servicing them. And I just want us to collectively learn how to be the example. Now let's get into some of these laws and rules here because we know we just had the Crown Act and we did have a politician say, you know, he didn't say this, but I'm just going to paraphrase. Ladosha, you spent all this money on the video, you're trying to do a documentary, y'all trying to pass laws around here, we got bigger issues. The people who are avoiding the issues the American people care about are on that side. And to get lectured by you and using that is so wrong, so out of touch with the American people. Avoiding, you gotta be kidding me. So, um, so they don't think hair is important. However, in this country, laws were real about how we could wear our hair. Um, so with that being said, how do laws, rules, and guidelines that chooses one set of standards uh, uh, for beauty or acceptable over another, how does that affect or impact, particularly this white, black situation? How does that affect? It's very important. So when we talk about cultural trauma, the studies show in order to heal cultural trauma, there has to be an element of justice. And, you know, we, we can do um, 
getting involved in the community, but you're, it has to be some sort of restitution. And that's when we look through history, there is restitution for other cultures. And so passing legislation to allow black people to be black is restitution that is part of healing the cultural trauma. Black people having decided that they're gonna be themselves, they're gonna wear their hair as they choose. We need to have that type of things put in place. There were so many laws that allow us to not be black. And I think that because we are always surviving, we're not really truly understanding their, their neurosis, their, their, their psychological, in a, their, 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 their psyche. We're not taking in consideration because me and you are trying to survive just their physical, their visceral lifestyle in which we're interacting called slavery. Right. So, but we have not ever tried to really deal with that this is a neurotic, psychotic kind of projecting onto other people what they probably are internally feeling. Mm. Highly coiled hair is difficult as opposed or relative to what? I guess white people's hair. Well, there we go again. Why does there always have to be an opposite mm -hmm. for us to solve our own problem? Mm -hmm. This man here's got an afro. This is an afro right here. Or somewhat of an afro. It's not yeah, big, no. Afro. But they want us to wear skin here. What they call it, high and tight. High and tight. High and tight. tight. It's not my culture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right tomorrow, around. he not only uh, you know, brought in the products and the goods, but he also, he did training because there's footage where African-American brothers was like, no, nah, you got, you can't just cut our hair. You got to cut it right. So did you wear Afro? Did you have one or you did the high, you know, you cut it all off? No, I, I, uh, I had an Afro. <laughs> I, I had an Afro. The American people have been for years told that the military leads the nation in breaking down and eliminating all vestiges of segregation. But it should have been brought up that we, you're going to discriminate against somebody about their Afro because society models the military, they have already done it. I think there's also so, a tremendous historical ignorance because uh, I think a lot of U.S. leaders have no clue as to modern history. But it was increasingly challenged by those who embrace black power and black pride. Begin seeking freedom by any means necessary. The most fundamentally what I'm arguing in this larger project is that the army shifted from thinking of itself as proudly race blind, as color blind, to thinking of itself as race conscious. Morrow traveled around the world in the 1970s, contracted by the Department of Defense to teach and cut hair on military bases and in war zones, where he wrote several books. He had textbooks and how, and, and pictures and manuals, and he did the uh, magazine called Curly Q. This was a reporter who wrote about the Gina Curl. And every time I went through all of these sites, they kept saying that Gina was saving the black woman from the woes of the natural hair movement. And so she's getting all this credit. So I get really upset. I'm almost like, if we let them take, she did not do this. Now there's some, some differences, don't know if they're not, but the concept of rearranging, yeah, and then putting it on the rollers and all that, that was definitely coming out of the California. And I just was offended that there was not one mention of that. They could find not one sentence to say perhaps it's inspired by Dr. William Mark. And if you don't know how wonderful you are, you're more apt to put yourself in harm's way. But they tell me also about history. If you don't know what was, you don't know what is. And if you don't know what is, you are prepared for what will be. Right, and so that's why we have to get the the, the history piece together. The Jerry curl and the California curl was not the same uh. curl at all. <laughs> 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 
Yo, I got like, like you were gapped up and you were like, <laughs> Now see that's the California curl right there. It started running when it had to be the curl had to be introduced by somebody other than a black person. So then they started talking about the Jerry curl. But Willie Morris California curl was out there way before any Jerry curl. And this was dated in 1971. The Jerry Curl didn't come out until 1978. That makes me undisputedly the founder, the formulator, the creator, the pioneer of the Cold War Curl. There is a disconnect in America when it comes to black history. It is a disconnect between the reality of this history and the distorted impression many young people have today. In recent years, memes and t-shirts have appeared saying, I'm not my ancestors. They believe that except for the occasional demonstration or revolt, all their ancestors mostly did was keep their heads low. Okay, we've been through our antics our movements and now we're down to our moment of truth and you guys know what they say about truth right come on stand with me there is your side my side and then there's the truth Major League Barbershop, that's where we at, that's where we here. It's Major League for a reason, I'm minor league. Afro hair in barber school was, was kind of bittersweet. They honestly didn't teach a lot. They teach a fail-safe structure on how to cut the human hair. any texture hair as the, the clients, you know, when they came and let us work on them. They didn't have any um, clients with texture hair. We didn't have any lessons on how to detangle it, how to manipulate it, or anything, anything like that. I got three mannequins in my kit, and all of them have straight hair. I was just like, so there, there is no intention on learning hair that's textured hair. Okay. Hmm. And anytime people of color come in for services, it seems that myself and my, my partner, like Nadia, was the other black woman, we would get all of those clients. And the other students would either pass them off or we would just be booked them when they called, when people called into book. I decided, man, if I want to be a real hairdresser, if I want to be a well-rounded hairdresser, yeah. I need to learn what I don't yet know. And that's, that's why true. I stayed. Even if it was a space that didn't, I didn't feel represented in. But then it dawned on me, I'm just like, here I am two months into getting real clients from, from coming in the door and not one of my white peers has made that decision for themselves. Mm. Now I went to the receptionist and was just like, hey, why are you booking all the textured guests with Renee and Nadia? Like, I want them too. At no point did they feel like they weren't getting a well-rounded education. I was aware of that, but they weren't aware of that. Whoa. And what that meant to me was, this is what is normal to them. And what I know as normal to me is niche to them. And I was just like, their entire understanding of how to learn hair is from a white perspective. And if it stays white, then there are no alarms that go off. The only alarms that go off are for people of color because they're outside of the white narrative. You know that you can't you need, you need more education, you need these reps, and I always tell you you need to remain teacher. And even even in, in the ones that come to school and they get licensed, always remain teachable, always continue to go back to get that. It's very important. So haircutting is not a black thing? No, it's not. It's a human thing. And that's the problem. Because they're not teaching everybody what to do. They're teaching what they think they're going to need. And you're going to need everything. That's your top loop. Anytime you're trying to take advantage of somebody, you tell them they don't need to learn anything. Mm. You know, 
Mm, that's you don't need to learn it. You already know how to do it. That is just so wrong. You know you, you black. Know? <laughs> black people, y'all don't, don't need education, okay? And you say? When you take away a licensure, you take away the professionalism and the consistency and it's no longer a profession and then people are going to charge nothing for something they should charge a lot. That's the difference in the cosmetologists today. There are younger people and they don't pledge allegiance to quote unquote one company anymore. You know, they use OTC over Absolutely. the counter. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, this is a conversation um, about the narrative that needs to just be talked about. And so one of the narratives that we hear in hair care is that it is black and white. Black people uh, have to do things different from white people. The difference is, is that it's easier for white people than it is for black people. And your experience with your hair was totally what? My hair is not consistent. It's some areas are more curly. So for me, there's no wash and go. So you um, don't know that narrative. I do not know that narrative. Oh, so what does your mom teach you about? Nothing. I feel like white mothers don't teach their children about hair care. They say, go take a shower, go brush your hair. There's not what happens oftentimes in like the black community or people of color where that becomes a mother daughter experience. Wow. Right? Where you are sitting together, it is just literally go do it's your soft. Do you think the natural hairstylist and boutique grading certificate offers adequate education for natural hairstylists, braiders, and lacticians? To just give a, um, a platform blanket access to that boutique license to all the stylists who are bringing people in and, and covering them under boutique. That is truly a careless um, thing to do because there's no way to know that these people are being trained or taught anything. And even with the boutique covering, I think that they should still do something formal in the way of state board cosmetic um, sanitation. Mm. That is huge. That's a paramount importance, sanitation, cleanliness, that needs to be taught on a structured level before anyone could even qualify to be covered under boutique. So can, can or should African American cosmetology, instructors of cosmetology, should they be approaching, I don't know. Yes, they should be approaching because we approach the other textures. We should include the African American hair because it's not going away. We're not We're not a people that we are disappearing. Mm -hmm. So we know Dr. Willie Morrow. He, he wrote the book on this. Of him. He wrote the book on this. I stand by him. You stand by him. I Why? stand by him. Why do you stand by I him? I said because he had so much knowledge. He was trying to share the knowledge with us. And sometimes we are so close-minded that we're not listening of what he's saying. Um, when, I, when I listen to him, he has so much knowledge that you can't help but to sit in the room. If you ever had the experience um, to just sit five minutes with him, you were blessed. He is speaking on uh, what we need to have. Stopping hair breakage, knowing what hair shed, and stopping all of those issues. That is my, I think, Mr. Morrow's greatest. Yeah. Oh, now here's the thing, a lot of people here in the United States kind of feel like, you know, we can do this stuff at home, so we don't need, you know, any education. Uh, what do you say as the founder of the Gay and Joe Skills Academy? I think that is a myth, and that myth must be, um, it's a paradigm that must be broken. I do not believe that anybody should do hair without learning how to do it. And in Africa, there are schools, and we've attested that level. So when you come to the Gambia, that they are schools, and they work with standards, and they work with code of color. Now, were they considered less? No. African, if they altered their hair. No, they didn't. That's what I'm saying. It was it was no, no back and forth because someone's hair looked it different. You know, from my research, I hadn't seen no one having a disagreement, even if we look at at at, at 
tribes that had clans. If you're an outsider because your hair looked like this because you use this chemical to straighten your hair or you use honey and this to coil your hair gripes, you know what I'm saying? And and, and uh, disagreements over the texture of the hair or disagreements over the different herbs or a salt or butter or animal animal fat or whatever they you know whatever they use palm oil it wasn't no disagreements yeah. schoolhouse rock but, but listen listen remember when we had this when you were educated we had this conversation and it's like you know first of all let's talk about the ownership black people believe and it is the truth that we take ownership in our hair. We own it. We own the culture. We own the braiding. We learn that this is something that we created. This is our innovation. We own it. We take ownership in it. So how can somebody else take it from us? That, that's one side of it. You can't take that from me because we learned that as we were growing, right? Nobody else could do that, right? As a lot of other things we've done that people take from the ground. But as we discussed, and you helped me in that, we have our dentists, we have our dermatologists, we have our primary care doctors. We have to have our hairstylists too because that is, this is a part of us. So, so if we don't have anybody to teach us that, then we continue to believe that we don't need extra credits or we don't need that much education. We don't need to build our standards because we know because it's uncomfortable. So I, I'm not taking that away from black people. What I'm saying is because we own this. We learned that ourselves. Nobody gave it to us. That's why we, don't, we seem to think we don't need a and when we know the past, then we can change the future. So what, in your opinion, does the future of cosmetology look like for everybody, for all of us? For all of us, um, it's, it's people who decide in their life that they want to be hairdressers to get the education on all hair types that they all deserve. William Morrow was a very gifted man. He, again, was uh, very famous. You know, in life, we can, one of the secrets to life is understanding that you have to find um, your difference, your leverage. And he created the hair pick, California curl, which later became Jerry Curl. Um, and he wrote, or oh, ushered in two main uh, styles, one the Afro and the other the Curl. And as a result of that, there were many millionaires. Uh, and others who benefited greatly uh, in our industry, which today is about uh, $10 billion in the U.S. In closing, uh, there is so much to say about the life of man, his life, the legend, himself and his family. But I just want to, I'm so pleased that I've had the opportunity to share with you just briefly some of the things that I knew about him and how he made such a a difference in the world we live in today is. When you put it personally, it's the safest way to put it. Um, there was something in me, for example, you know, sometimes, and certainly when I was much younger, which resented the assumption on which all these things are based. It assumes that you have something I want. That um, there, is, there really isn't on the basis of it. Just looking at the evidence. Any reason for white people to assume the Negroes want to be like them? And this is very difficult. I have, I have said in effect that white men must give up what is in effect a crutch. That's right. Come on, Some die. Yes. <laughs> I'm like, I'm so speechless. I'm so, 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 so happy to meet you. Yes, my whole entire career is because of you. Yes. I'm sorry you ever... You have liberated us in so many ways to be so profound and to be so proud and to always be open to learn and to respect our elders, to carry forth the legacy. And you've done a lot beyond <laughs> you know, what you can imagine. 
I'm from Cleveland, Ohio. Just uh, yeah, Cleveland. Every day, we always talk about Dr. Willie Marlowe. Wow. wow. <laughs> wow. In 2022, you're still the man. And it's a pleasure that I come all the way here, but to be honest, I, it's a pleasure that you are still here. The pleasure is really all of ours. Um, we're doing this documentary about this narrative that we have been denied. And when I met your daughter, you know, she said to me that, you know, we have to change the narrative. We cannot depend on other people. You agree? There are lots of changes, and the changes start with us, the newer generation, and me passing it forward to the younger generation to know that we can carry forth the legacy. So there, there are changes. We are changing the way we learn our history. We're changing to tell the truth about the history. So we are, we are, we are going to do right. My name is Victoria Webster and I'm the owner of Blossom to Beauty Hair Salon. I'm Edgar B. Jackson Jr., MD, clinical professor of medicine at Case Western Reserve University. And I want you to help change the narrative. My goal would be to advise all of our young people, especially, to help change. This has been the narrative. You know, it's my greatest expectation that this documentary has given us all something to think about. Um, hopefully we are all enlightened, a tad bit more informed, and of course, uh, most certainly inspired. You know, my career as a cosmetologist was fueled by my work as an outreach worker. And I love to tell the story of my very first day uh, in my field placement um, at Family Health of Beachbrook. And my then supervisor, her name was Terry Ali. And I'll never forget what she said to me as I proceeded in my career professionally as an outreach worker to help others. I'm gonna share it with you guys and I hope you will take this wholeheartedly as we venerate, we respect, and we carry forth the legacy of our elders as well as our ancestors. And her message to me was, Ladosha, always remember, 
you have a greater responsibility than to yourself. Mm. I say, my good people, I say, that's the narrative. Yeah, that's the narrative. Elementary School, and we're doing.